start in about five minutes, uh, so you can still talk, and then uh, in five minutes, JC will give a talk on ensemble learning and the Netflix competition, uh, and then we'll open up it up for discussion, and then I'll end the session uh, hopefully within an hour, an hour of ten minutes, uh, with a small introduction about bootstrapping, so like a small statistical concept. Uh, we have a guest here who wants to tape the session, so if you don't want to be taped, let him know, and he will avoid you. Yeah. <laughs> Another five minutes uh, of talking about a basic statistical concept called bootstrapping. Uh, I know many of you might, some of you might have a lot of statistical background, some might not. Uh, so for those who do know about this, it'll be a refresher. For those who don't, hopefully you'll have a new tool to use. So bootstrapping. So the idea here is that you don't have too much data. So you, you, data is expensive to gather for you. You can't run too many experiments. So little data. So an example of that could be, see, say you have a web service and you want to measure the, session, the amount of time that a user on average spends on your web service. Uh, and you want to figure out how long the user spend there, whether you should optimize your website or whatever. So say you're measuring uh, over one week, you have one user and you're looking at how many times he logs in. And he logs in only, say, four times. And all of those four times, you're measuring the amount of time he's spending on the website. Then you have next week, he also logs in also only, say, four or five times. So what are some things that you would like to find out about this user? You would want to figure out how much time on average does he spend on your web service. So you might want to find the mean time. If you take the samples from week one, you might get a distribution of the samples like this. If you were to compute a mean value, your mean value might fall somewhere over here. Uh, where somewhere over here. That's not the type of value you want. You would prefer the expected value to be somewhere over here. But how can you say with confidence that this value, say, or this value, really represents the amount of time that the user is spending on your web service? There is no confidence that you can get for this value. So you want a mean with some level of confidence. And second, say you want to compare the means between the two weeks. You want to see whether a change actually affected the user. So week one, you tried out one version of the site. Week two, you tried a different version of the site. How did that affect the retention of the user? So if in week two, the time series look like that, so you plot your sample, you have the, basically I'm considering you have the amount of time that the user spends here and how often you see that value. If you were to compute, say, either the mean or the expected value, you can say that the two are different. You can say that something got, uh, the user got somehow affected that, say, week two, you spend more time on the website. Now, if you wanted to do a t-test, so compare the two distributions, you would get a very weird answer. So say you had one time series, this is one week, and then the next week, you have here. The t-test might actually say that your mean value is somewhere here, and that the distributions are the same. And the reason it would do that, because the t-test assumes that your distribution is normal. So the t-test was assumed that your distribution for both weeks looks something like that. So the mean value falls in the middle, and is the most frequently seen value, and it basically uses that assumption when it tries to compare the distributions. So the t-test won't work for you here. So comparing the performance reliably between the two weeks and drawing some kind of statistical conclusion is very difficult. So what can we do to uh, help the situation? What we do is we can use the bootstrap. So what that will do is we can take 
subsets of our data and take means of those subsets. subsets. So basically, many means of many subsets. So the subsets that we take, they have to be have a uniform probability. So any subset that you form uh, has the same chance of uh, being formed and you re use replacement. So if you pick a value, you put it back and you pick the next one, basically uniform probability. So say you form subsets like S11, S12, S11, and the next subset can be S13, S12, S14. Basically you take thousands of these subsets. And the thing we can use is the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem basically says that the means of the subsets, if you take enough of them, will eventually form a normal distribution. So once you have these means, you can estimate the actual expected mean of your sample. So even though you have very few data points to go off of, you can basically create your, create your own data and take the means of these and decide or find out the underlying mean of your samples uh, with a certain confidence and with a cer certain probability, right? So we solve the first problem. We can actually estimate a uh, possible expected mean for week one. We can do the same thing for week two. So say for week two, we can have something like this. Again, normal distribution and it will lie over here. Again, we have a normal distribution and we can now use the t-test to compare them. And the comparison will actually give us a, pot, prop, um, a reliable result that we can put a confidence, intro, confidence in. So the idea here is even though we start from very few samples, we pull ourselves by our bootstraps and we basically turn it into a more reliable uh, computation where we can actually uh, come up with statistical properties about our data. Does that make sense? <laughs> Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, can yeah. you, so the problem was we didn't have a lot of data. Yeah. We wanted to find the mean with confidence. Yeah. And we couldn't do that unless we used bootstrapping. Yeah. Uh, so what's the intuition behind like the validity of bootstrapping? Like why is it meaningful to do that? like why does this technique bring something that actually has value? Like it, it seems to me it's like you you have no data and then you synthesize it or you do something weird so that you have something to work with. Like I don't Well you don't do anything weird, you're still using the same data. You just taking various portions of that data and seeing what the mean of the various portions are. And you take enough of them and use this assumption, the statistical assumption of the central value theorem to then come up with a distribution of sorts for the possible mean values. So this is not necessarily your exact mean yeah. because yeah, you, you don't have enough data to know the exact mean of the sample, but you can come up with an actual confidence of how, how well you think this mean would represent the mean of that actual sample. Okay, yeah, I, I get the process, but it's just, uh, I guess I just don't have the intuition. I think uh, you may think about it like, when you have less data, for example, like I give you an example, like one, two, three, a thousand. When you get mean, it will become like 100, you know? Now it start to do boost, boost traffic on this several times, you get like, get the effect of the thousand lower and, and lower as as you do uh, bootstrapping more and more. So you eliminate almost like the, you like create, the, yeah, you create almost your distribution out of that. I mean, okay, so you could do that, but if your data is so small, why can't you just look at it and say, okay, I think my mean is somewhere here. You can do I, mean, too. I mean, what is the uh, dangerous thing to do? And then the question is, how much can you place in your expected value from the small subject? 
by bootstrapping, we're transforming the underlying distribution of your data into something which you can more readily analyze with our crappy human brains. Um, we're not good at thinking about distributions that are complex or strangely shaped. Um, we're much better at looking at something like a normal distribution of your data. About 95% or so is under this area, so I'm going to go ahead and say that this is safe. Yeah, because if you look at the expected the, values somewhere here, they, they're not representative, right? The, the interesting thing about this test is that if you don't trust this test, yeah. don't trust any other statistic, because this test depends on the center of the theorem, as does almost all of the basic frequency test statistics. Um, it's a very cool thing, and reading is very, very enlightening. I recommend it. Um, it's cool stuff. I'll play around with it, and then maybe I'll talk more about it. <laughs> Like I, I understand it, I just there's something missing in my head. <laughs> it's not a, it's not an intuitive thing. You know? yeah. Like it's it's pretty strange to think if I just take a bunch of samples of my data and mean them together, why will my mean be normally distributed? It's that it doesn't it's not immediately obvious. But as you as you read more about how the proof works, it, it really starts to make sense. Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with this theorem, but if you have wildly distributed um, results or data, um, does it work the same way if you use the median? Or is it just the mean? No, I think the median from what, they, they just produce different distributions. I think the median they, is more robust as an estimate of your expected value, yeah. given an unusual distribution. But um, it really depends on what you're looking at. Okay. Um, the weirder the distribution, the less you should depend on a uh, simple method like the median Right. Okay. Thank you for coming up. maybe some uh, forms uh, to get your feedback and possibly plan for the next one for the topic. Uh, so please fill out and we can tailor it to whatever you guys most want to listen or talk about. All right. Thanks. Thank you.